Children of the Great Depression, Chapter 7, The Lone Ranger and Captain Midnight. Kids who could afford to buy a movie ticket look forward to Saturday afternoon at the movies. Admission to the Saturday matinee costs 10 cents. That seemed like a lot of money during the Great Depression, but it bought a lot of entertainment. For one thin dime, a kid could see a double feature, two full-length movies, an animated cartoon, a short newsreel dealing with current events, a humorous short subject, and the latest episode of a serial, a continuing adventure story told one chapter a week. Along with all that, some theaters offered a bonus, a free ice cream or a frozen chocolate-covered banana. The cereal especially packed them in every Saturday. Each episode had a cliffhanger ending. The heroes seemed hopelessly cornered by evildoers or trapped by an avalanche, a stampede, a tidal wave, or some other catastrophe. Suspense built up all during the week as every movie fan tried to guess how the hero could possibly escape. Favorite serial heroes included Tarzan of the Apes, Flash Gordon of the Distant Planet Mongo, and Wild West figures such as the Lone Ranger, who also appeared in many full-length many full-length features. These films were so involving that some kids brought cap guns to the the theater, and fired noisily at the outlaws and cattle wrestlers on the silver screen. Theater owners began to insist that young gunslingers check their pistols at the movie house door. Along with the enormously popular westerns, children of the 1930s enjoyed certain movies that have been recognized as classics and are still being shown today. Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Dwarfs, 1937, was the first full-length animated feature. It contained 250,000 individual drawings, all broke all attendance records, and was translated into 10 languages. Another perennial favorite, The Wizard of Oz, 1939, began, begins as a black-and-white film. When Dorothy, played by 16-year-old Judy Garland, is swept up by a Kansas tornado to the magical land of Oz, the film suddenly switch to breathtaking color. At that time, a recent film in innovation always made audiences gasp. Hollywood's top box office star during the 1930s was a child, Shirley Temple. She made her first film in 1934 when she was five years old. By the time she was six, her films were taking in millions of dollars a year. She was often featured as an orphan who overcomes poverty and hardship through pluck and luck. Her rags-to-riches stories with their Hollywood-style happy endings helped depression audiences forget hard times and escape for an hour or two to a world where everything was bound to turn out all right. Kids who didn't have a dime for the movies could listen to the radio, the most popular form of home entertainment during the 1930s. Commercial television didn't arrive until the late 1940s. Back then, radio offered a much greater variety of programs than it does today. Hundreds of stations across the country broadcast soap operas, talent shows, serious dramas, comedy shows, mysteries, quizzes, sports events, especially baseball, and both classical and now popular music programs. Music wasn't important, was it as important in the lives of young people as then as it is now. Top band leaders and vocalists of the era were as famous as movie stars. Fans drew sharp a sharp distinction, distinction between sweet bands popularized by lead 
Leaders such as Guy Lombardo, which featured a dreamy, sentimental, sometime, some said schmaltzy sound, and swing bands led by Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller, Duke Ellington, and others, with their driving rhythm and Im improvised solos akin to jazz. Teenagers clustered around their radios to listen to their favorite bands on weekly broadcasts. On Saturday evenings, before disc jockeys and top 40 hit charts were commonplace, kids tuned into Your Hit Parade, which presented the top 10 tunes of the week, saving the top three hits for the end of the show. Some of the hit tunes of the 1930s, and the angels sing, A Tisket, A Tasket, Deep Purple, Harbor Lights, Love Locked In, Moon Over Miami, Over the Rainbow, Pennies from Heaven, Red Sails in the Sunlight, The Way You Look Tonight, You Must Have Been a Beautiful Baby. Weekday evenings between 5 and 6 o'clock were known as the children's hour on radio. While dinner was being prepared, kids sat glued to the radio, listening to a parade of suspenseful 15-minute radio serials, one after another. Many of these shows had kids as their main characters and or as assistants to the adult hero. Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy, told the story of a brainy, brawny teenage athlete who plunged headlong into thrilling adventures all over the world with his friends Betty and Billy Fairfield and their wise and witty Uncle Jim. Introduced in 1933 and broadcast regularly until 1951, this was one of the longest-running programs aimed at kids. Westerns were as popular on the radio as they were on movie screens. The Lone Ranger, also introduced in 1933, was heard in at least 20 million homes and the words, hi -o, Silver, away, shouted by the Lone Ranger as he mounted on his Arabian Stallion Silver, were familiar to every kid in America. Parents liked the show because the Lone Ranger spoke perfect English and never shot to kill Although the outlaws he fought sometimes killed each other, he drew his pistols only in self-defense or to protect another's life, and when he did shoot, he fired silver bullets. He appeared in the, a radio serial, a movie serial, in feature-length films, and the 1950s television series, and in comic books. Captain Midnight, another popular radio ser serial, followed the adventures of an undercover agent and airplane pilot who was constantly battling the evil plots of Ivan Shark and his nasty daughter, Fury. The captain was aided in his efforts by his teenage friends, Joyce and Chuck, who were members of his secret squadron. Young listeners could join the secret secret squadron by sending in a dime and the label from a jar of Ovaltine, one of the show's sponsors. In return, they received a special decoder badge, the mystery dial code O-Graph, which enabled them to decode a sec the secret message broadcast at the end of each episode. Captain Midnight, which began in 1938, also moved to film and later to television. The Aldridge Family, a weekly comedy show centered on the adolescent mishaps of Henry Aldrich and appealed especially to teenagers. Henry was 16 when the program began in 1939. He was still 16 when it ended in 1953. Radio shows had one big difference from television. Listeners had to use their imaginations in order to see the characters, the settings, and the action. Mother would come to the door and holler, It's time for Jack Armstrong, one listener recalled, and we would come to the living room. It was radio, so Jack Armstrong looked like whatever you wanted him to. You could imagine everything. Imaginations were aided by the ingenious men and women who created radio sound effects. A wooden match snapped near the microphone sounded like a bat hitting a baseball. 
horses galloping could be uh, into <laughs> Imitated by beating coconut shells on an old board. Twisting cellophane sounded like a crackling fire. Squeezing a box of scorn starch suggested footsteps in the snow. Sounds made manually on the spot were supplemented by recorded sounds. A speeding train, a barking dog, a roaring lion, a cheering crowd. Most children growing up in the Depression didn't have a lot of money to spend on toys and games. Radio shows offered them a chance to obtain popular toys cheaply. Many of the shows were sponsored by his cereal companies. By sending in cereal box tops and a coin or two, often a dime, the kids could order kites, whistles, badges, tops, and hundreds of other wonderful treasures. The hikometer hooked to your belt registered how many miles you hiked. The five-way detectoscope was a cardboard and metal device for sighting objects and estimating their distance. Jack Armstrong fans sent away for whistle rings like the one Jack wore. The ring arrived in the mail with a copy of Jack's secret whistle code. Other shows offered rings outfitted with secret compartments with compasses, magnets, flashlights, and sirens, and with mirrors that allowed you to see behind you without turning your head. Some rings glowed in the dark. Because the rings were made up of cheap metal, most of them turned the wearer's, fe wearer's finger green after a few days. Some families could not afford to buy the packaged cereals, breakfast, packaged breakfast cereals, and other products that sponsored radio shows. When it came to box tops and toys and gadgets uh, you could get with them, many poor kids were out of luck, but they could always make their own toys. One of the most popular homemade toys during the 1930s was a rubber band gun made from a piece of wood, a clothespin, and a rubber band. Kids pretending to be cowboys or detectives could shoot a rubber band 10 feet or more with one with one of these. With a crayon and a, or a bit of paint, wooden clothes pins could also be, be transformed into dolls, soldiers, or other make-believe people. Two tin cans connected by a long stream served as kind of a primitive walkie-talkie. By speaking into one can, you could communicate with a distant friend who was holding the open end of the other can against a against one ear. Boys held racing contests with homemade pushmobiles or sidewalk racers. All that was needed to build one was a discarded milk box or a crate from, a grocery, from the grocery store and long wooden plank from a construction site and a peer, pair of old clam, clamp on steel roller skates. Rollerblades and skateboards were in the distant future. A kid would nail the skates to either end of the plank as wheels. The crate was nailed to the top of the plank up front. Tin cans might be added as headlights or taillights, along with an old license plate or automobile hood ornament. Standing on the wood plank with one foot, holding onto the sides of the crate, a boy would power his racers with his free foot and the help and a helping push at the top of the st steep hill. These simple depression era racers built with scavenged materials developed into the soapbox derby competitions held nationally today. Several million families were too poor during the Great Depression to even own a radio. Out of nearly 34 million American households in 1938, about 27 million, or 79%, possessed radios. Today, 98.2% of American households have at least one TV set. Kids who could not tune into the popular shows of the 1930s often felt isolated and lonely. We were just poor renters on a farm, and there was no money for a radio or the books I liked so much. A 14-year-old Texas girl wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt, Dear First Lady, I have read 
of your kind heartedness and cheer you have brought so many. Can't you suggest some way that I get a radio so I can hear the music and talk and news from the outside from outside my very small little world? All right, now for the pictures. Uh, the first picture up here is uh, some a group of boys looking at um, the coming attractions at an Omar West Virginia movie house. So you can see there that it costs 10 cents admission. The next picture is a, a lining up for a, matin, a movie matinee in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A group of girls getting ready to go see the movies. Next pictures down here are, this is Judy Garland portraying Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. And this is Mrs. Roosevelt meeting with Shirley Temple in 1938. Next we have a boy listening to the radio in Aberdeen, boys listening to the radio in Aberdeen, South Dakota. Next, we have a picture of Clayton Moore, who played the Lone Ranger. Um, he was actually one of a few actors who played the role on radio, films, and television since it was on for such a long time. There were quite a few actors who played the Lone Ranger. Um, next, we have um, a girl playing with, uh, this is Jack's game, uh, and a ball, so you try to bounce the ball and see how many jacks you can pick up and then you have this is that's the part of the boy the other part is um i don't see he the other part of him is not here but um he was playing marbles in the street in chicago um so jacks and marbles these were two very games uh, uh popular games that could be played and they weren't didn't cost much money um, then you have a boy playing a phonograph um, at his uh, at the sharecropper's home um, in Louisiana. So a phonograph, kind of like a record player, a predecessor to a record player. Um, these two boys are watching a puppet show in Red House, West Virginia. And that is the last for Chapter 7, Children of the Great Depression.